Well, hello and welcome to uh, episode 41 of VV Brief Podcast. Uh, today, we're having a chat with uh, Carola Jonas, the founder and CEO of Australian EV charging technology company, Everty. Uh, Ms. Jonas, welcome to EV Brief. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Now, you have a, an educational background in uh, business and marketing, I believe, and you've got a huge breadth of experience in the energy and EV space. Uh, is that right? Can you tell me a bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're, you're right. I uh, traditionally studied business and commerce and uh, then worked in freight and logistics for a long time, but also um, looking at environment and sustainability in the freight and logistics sector. As you would know, uh, energy is the biggest polluting sector and transport, including freight and logistics, is the second biggest uh, polluter in or polluting industry. And so I was always interested in how we can do things more efficient, how we can reduce emissions along supply chains. And so, so let, that led me into the whole like um, clean tech space. Um, I helped companies like put solar on, on warehouses, but also calculated um, uh, uh, emissions from uh, or CO2 emissions from supply chains. And uh, then I got to that point where I thought I want even more impact, like just cleaning up and helping logistics companies wasn't going to cut it. And so I then um, moved into different roles in like carbon offsets, renewable um, energy certificates, et cetera. And eventually before I started Everty, I was uh, working for a American company called Enphase Energy. And uh, so there they um, have micro inverters, batteries that can go into garages, smart home energy management software. And I was looking at Australia being the leader in uh, rooftop solar. And then why wouldn't people have electric cars that they can charge for free from their solar, from green or renewable energy. And so, yeah, that, that led me into um, founding Everty and really tackle that, that EV problem that Australia had uh, back then in 2016. We'll have to come back to that. It's an interesting point you make because I don't know, people seem to be, well, a, lot of, a lot of Australia at least seems to be almost a little bit afraid about the technology around electric cars when it is really quite simple and when we have embraced uh, solar so, so, so wholeheartedly. So that's something we'll have to come back and discuss. Um, but Everty, let's talk about that. You founded it a few years ago. What uh, products and services does your company provide? Yeah, so, so we identified that one of the biggest uh, barriers for the uptake of EVs was um, access to charging infrastructure. Um, I myself uh, at the time lived in a, an apartment with um, on-street parking, and so I needed public charging infrastructure, and there was simply not enough of it. Uh, so what we've decided to do, rather than building infrastructure and deploying charging stations on a large scale ourselves, uh, we wanted to enable other businesses and companies to, to do that and um, to provide charging to their customers, like shopping centers or um, corporates that want to um, um, offer EV charging to their staff or for their um, work fleet. So we, we really just looked at uh, what's the transaction between an electric car and a charging station and how can we get more of these transactions, more drivers and more charging stations together and have them uh, build out uh, a, a proper charging infrastructure um, uh, market. And so our, our product is a software solution that enables charging station operators to efficiently operate and monitor and monetize their charging stations. But it's also a driver app where um, you can find charging stations. And then um, similar to like your Uber app, you press like start and stop, and then we take a payment at the end uh, so that the charging station operator also gets a bit of a return uh, on, on uh, investment. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I mean, a lot of EV drivers use something like uh, PlugShare to find EV points, but Everty is unique in that you allow, is it right, you allow residential um, plug owners to actually monetize their, their power point? Um, well, that's how we started in okay, 2015, okay. but um, it's it's not no longer the core of our business model because okay. what we found at the time was that um, if you want to to rent out your charger, uh, you might want to you can do that, and uh, we facilitated that. But there weren't enough EV drivers who actually wanted to rent a private charger, right. and that comes back to the pro um, problem that back then. Um, when you had you, you would not buy an EV if you can't charge it at home yourself. Like a, at that time, with um, such a lack of charging infrastructure, uh, people just didn't dare buying an EV if they couldn't charge at home. And so, if you can already charge at home, then you don't need to go to someone else's home to charge. 
And that's where we then started looking more into like the whole transactions and software and operation of charging infrastructure. Right, because I think a lot of business and corporates, they want to get involved in this space. You know, they're starting to see the benefits to themselves and, and to their customers and staff, but I suppose it's quite a complex realm to enter. So you're providing uh, turnkey solutions for these companies, yeah. is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we work with um, a variety of uh, players in the market. Uh, we help councils to get charging infrastructure into um, their council car parks that are then available to the public. We work with um, public car parks in office buildings and universities, shopping centers. So essentially any car park where there's electricity and where people stay for like a couple of hours is a charging location. Mm -hmm. And so um, over the next uh, five to 10 years, we will see this market explode. Like every, every building will have charging as part of a service uh, in a car park. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen most states and territories now get on board with EV incentives and concessions and, and also now sort of plan DC rapid charging networks. Um, do you think there's enough consideration from sort of state governments and federal government at the moment around regulating the provision of uh, EV charging in homes and businesses uh, for, for strata, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the states are already mandating that any new buildings need to be built what they call EV ready. So then at least like the wiring and the capacity is there to install a charger further down the track. But um, at the moment, uh, there, there is really no, nothing that prevents any company um, from, from uh, providing EV charging or installing charging infrastructure. And I think what we see from the government's, uh, uh, the, the investments that they're making in fast charging, for example, that is very um, important early on in the market mm. because that is the confidence booster. But once uh, the confidence is there and people buy EVs on a large scale, then you really need to go a lot broader and not just like the, the highway fast charging. Then you need to have charging ev everywhere where cars are parked, especially workplaces. Yeah, I think one of the biggest selling points uh, for early adopters and for consumers generally is that the car will be charged every time you step into it in the morning uh, when you go to work, when we, when we do finally get to go back to work. So we do need to look at not just DC charging, but we need to look at AC options, don't we, that are on people's doorsteps. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you look at DC charging, people always think, oh, yeah, it's, going, it's like going to a petrol station. You go to a DC fast charger and you plug in for 10 to 20 minutes and then you go home. Mm. But the best thing about EVs is that you actually don't have to go somewhere to refuel. You can refuel anywhere uh, at right. any time if there's electricity available to you. Yeah, I think I was reading something recently that um, the US is probably the one market that's different to the rest of the world in how they charge their EVs. Apparently, a lot of um, owners, they actually, they use it like a gas station. <laughs> they drive to the Tesla supercharger, not because they need to go somewhere, but because they're going to fill up, whereas most the rest of us, we sort of do this en route. So there's this real kind of mindset shift that needs to happen around the world uh, sometimes. Yeah, and I think, uh, fun fact, I think it was Ford in the US um, they have actually produced like a sort of like smell or perfume that uh, resembles a petrol station because they thought EV drivers <laughs> miss the smell of petrol. <laughs> I can't say it's a particularly pleasant scent, but um, yes. no. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, before you, you mentioned uh, renewables and solar, you've got uh, experience in that area um, and, and storage is key as well. Um, so I suppose as EV uptake increases, um, is there potential for Everty software or for your business to assist with um, network demand um, across the grid as, as this uptake does increase? Absolutely. We, we already do that in, in various ways. Right. So the one thing, of course, that is important uh, through our software, we, we are um, gathering a lot of data where EVs are, when people charge. So that will be very important for um, the network providers to really understand the clusters of EVs and, and the patterns of when they charge. But we're also already doing energy and load management in buildings where we can um, uh, integrate our software with a building management system that then tells us how much energy is available for EV charging. And then our algorithms split that down to the individual charges. Uh, we can control any charger in real time and say charge, don't charge, charge only that much um, uh, on, a, on a per amps level. So uh, we can very, in a very granular level um, go and uh, throttle charges up and down depending on what either a building or the grid or anything else uh, in the wow. environment, in the ecosystem wow. needs. 
Wow. Who are, who are some of your clients? Can you name uh, any clients sort of in, in the big cities in Australia? Or do you sort of work with, uh, with architects and developers at that level of, um, of these buildings being, being built? Yeah, so we have a, um, a variety of clients, uh, for example, in the property sector, mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with Charter Hall to roll out oh, um, charging stations across their office buildings. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky enough uh, to, to work in the Sydney CBD in one of their buildings, uh, that now has charging stations for you to use. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, as I mentioned, work with councils. We've recently gone live with Lake Macquarie City Council, uh, who installed a charger at their library, but they made it um, open to, to the public. And that's very important for EV tourism, uh, for anyone who wants to, to drive from Sydney up to Lake Macquarie for a holiday now has a DC charger at the library for their use. Yeah, brilliant. And I think people want to see that there's uh, not just Tesla superchargers being rolled out. They want to see that there's uh, access for any brand to be able to, to be able to travel out of out of major cities, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. What, are, what are some of the present challenges for businesses in Australia looking to integrate the technology solutions? You, you talked about some of the, the solutions that you're providing, but do you see any obstacles in the in the present um, climate for business? Um, I, I think the the, the, the only problem for businesses at this stage really is, uh, is now the right time for them to invest. Uh, charging stations are unfortunately not uh, very cheap. Hmm. And so it's a considerable amount of uh, money that a business has to invest to provide charging stations. But we're still at very low levels of EV uptake. So in, in five years' time, there'll be no question the market will be flooded. But at this time, we still see some businesses hesitating, but also others um, who, who just take this uh, as a, a way to differentiate themselves. And uh, going even further, um, speaking of our customer charter hall, they don't even want to differentiate themselves. Mm. Uh, they are saying uh, an EV charger is the same uh, like bicycle storage, like a shower or a lift. Like it's just part of a building and it's part of end, what they call end of trip facilities. Mm. And so for them, it was a no brainer to roll that out across their portfolio. And hopefully that's what it does become, you know, even for those who don't drive an EV, they see the infrastructure there every time they come into their building or, or they go past their local council facilities and it just starts to stick in their mind that this transition is happening. Isn't, isn't that what it yeah. should be? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I guess the, the decarbonisation of Australia is beginning across transport and energy sectors, um, but do you think there's anything else the, the federal government should be looking to do as we face a sort of general phase out of combustion engines um, by, by, I guess, in the next decade? Yeah, I think there's obviously always more that can be done. Like some mm. countries have uh, very aggressive policies where they um, want to ban the sale of uh, petrol and hybrid cars. And one good story there is, uh, for example, the UK. So a couple of years ago, they said they would ban um, the sale of uh, petrol cars by 2040. Then they brought it forward to 2035. And then uh, last year they said, oh no, actually we're gonna achieve that by 2030. And uh, Jaguar obviously being an English car maker based uh, in the UK said, hold on, if I can't sell a Jaguar by 2030 because they're petrol cars, we now have to become an all electric car company and they want to achieve that by 2025. So that, that basically shows you how important policy is to, to drive change across the whole value chain and not, not just like on the policy level. Totally. I think that's something that's always frustrated me in Australia. You know, there is this sort of uncertainty on the policy front and we know that this, this does drive investment. And I suppose to some extent, um, private investment has has done very well in Australia with the likes of companies like yours and Tritium and manufacturers like um, SEA Electric and things. But you do, do need that certainty from above to actually drive even more investment, don't you? Absolutely. And I, I think the announcement from the New South Wales government uh, was uh, quite substantial. And uh, for, for example, that, that was only announced uh, two months ago. Mm. Uh, we've now raised capital and we're employing more people. So we're creating local jobs. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that's what we need to see. It's the opportunity, not the threat of not selling oil anymore. This is an opportunity to create a lot of jobs and make the planet a, a healthier and more livable place. Yeah, definitely. Because I think, you know, a lot of people like to talk about net zero by 2050 and this sort of thing. But apart from the feel good factor, what does that actually mean? You know, we actually need to start making moves towards that target right now in this year, don't we? And that has to happen through sort of a, an immediate transition 
to new technologies, to accepting electric vehicles, to, to moving to renewables. Um, and I guess at the beginning of this conversation, you, you talked about renewables and storage um, in Australia and this kind of, I suppose, dissonance between, between the solar rollout and, and sort of the other end of behind the meter stuff. Um, so what, what do you think we can do in Australia to really um, improve the access to and the rollout of, uh, I guess, battery storage and uh, smarter grids? Um, yeah, I think we're actually on the right way, mm -hmm. uh, even though I, I often say we need better policies and then the politicians say, oh, no, we leave it to, uh, to the market <laughs> to decide. I think the tipping point has already arrived, like um, solar energy or wind energy are some of the cheapest forms of, uh, of electricity or energy you can generate. And we're, we're going to see the phase out of coal and, and yeah. even gas, like we're... Yeah even though we, we had gas on this like technology roadmap um, already, like you have uh, private um, equity and uh, private investors to say we're no longer investing in any oil or gas or coal project. And so, yeah, it's just a matter of time, but I think people will be surprised by how quick this change is actually going to take place. So you, you mentioned you have a background in, in logistics and obviously the transport sector in Australia is not only vitally important to uh, moving goods around, but they also make up a huge percentage of emissions in Australia. Um, what do you think um, needs to be done in terms of making uh, the transport industry more sustainable in this country and globally for that matter? Yeah, so, so there are already um, trials uh, going on in, in the logistics sense, um, sector for uh, electric trucks. Um, they're, they're also at some stage will be hydrogen trucks, so it's not all EVs. It's mm. it always uh, it's like find the right technology for, um, for for the right use case. But especially like um, my space was like international and global freight, and looking at uh, air freight and ocean freight um, that can be so much more efficient over time. Mm. But but also I think um, we're we're seeing a going back to let's reduce plastic do we need this product like uh, we're, we're taking a step back from this um, excessive consumerism and we're really asking ourselves do we need that that next product or do we need a plastic straw can we just like drink from from the glass <laughs> and, yeah. and so i think there's a big mind shift uh, with that uh, current and upcoming um, generation especially the school strikes and everything mm. i think yeah we're the, the ways of the 80s and 90s are, are definitely um, over and we're now all becoming a bit more conscious about the environment and our impact on the planet. I suppose the difficulty with this kind of consumerist mindset is that you know we don't have to consider where our waste goes or, or how we use things so until there's a price to us as individuals for for using a straw or you know sh shipping something from Amazon um, I say that as, as a package city at my door um, you know like we, we need to um, we need to really consider that don't we absolutely but uh, I think also um, that there is a price that we will eventually pay uh, I guess uh, you, you would know that uh, last year China decided not to take our waste anymore and now suddenly yeah. um, Australia is investing heavily into recycling and how we're going to deal with our va uh, waste and that will come back to the consumer because in the end it's the taxpayer, the consumer who pays for whatever needs to be done and achieved. In some ways I think it's a good wake-up call for us as Australians that we, we needed that kick to sort of get the industry going in Australia and sort of create demand for, for recycled products, didn't we? Absolutely, yeah. I also wanted to ask, as a female leader in your field, would you say there are clear pathways for young women with a passion uh, for a career in the energy or EV tech sector? Absolutely. Um, I, I don't think, even though um, in the energy sector more broadly, and maybe also in my previous uh, sector, freight and logistics, mm. there are naturally like more men in engineering and in, in these sectors. But um, I actually, with my, my contacts uh, uh, that I deal with day to day, the hardware, the charging station manufacturers, the car manufacturers, they have a lot of women employed. So I don't mm. feel at all that there's no women in our industry. Totally. And uh, there's also a, a new program being established uh, called Women in EVs, where we, we just like, yeah, raise a bit of awareness and to bring people together. Oh, fantastic. So that's a, a sort of an industry networking uh, organization, is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Would well, you have any advice for those young women who might be interested in the industry sort of starting out, uh, moving from, from high school or, or university? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what I would uh, suggest to people is, uh, first of all, look at industry networking events. Obviously, through, through COVID, uh, this has slowed down a little. Um, but there is always uh, networking events, uh, either industry specific or for startups. And then really build, build your network early on. If, if you're leaving a school or university, um, make sure that every time you meet someone who's in the space that you're interested in, that you get your, um, their name, you connect with them on LinkedIn and stay in touch and they will open doors to, to other people. Um, a lot of this is happening um, with uh, having the right network around you. Right, great. Well, look, finally, I just wanted to ask maybe uh, if you could share uh, an inspirational story or, or a moment from your journey in setting up uh, Everty uh, and your sort of your, your journey into the, the clean tech space. Yeah, look, it's, um, th th there wasn't like a particular moment, but I, I, I think when, when we've decided uh, to, to go ahead and found, found um, Everty, Obviously, I came from a corporate career, which was very different to transitioning into, into the startup space and mm -hmm. uh, building a business from scratch. And what I have found is that there's such a great community out there, um, all the way from co-working spaces, accelerators. That, that's what I mean with this whole network and ecosystem. There's so many people who offer, offer you help in the early days with no expectations of getting anything in return. And I think that is uh, compared to the corporate world where everyone fights for, for their, their um, role in their job. Um, yeah, it was an eye opener to see that uh, young businesses can, can emerge from, from nothing and everyone's supportive of each other. I suppose that's a, the nice thing about an industry like this where you have probably, hopefully, a good mix of, of men to women and you have sort of a lot of young people and a lot of really engaging, uh, educated entrepreneurs. People are willing to sort of share ideas and cross-pollinate, that sort of thing. Yeah, and especially, I mean, with EVs, everyone likes to talk about cars anyway, mm. but everyone who's ever driven an EV, they are so much more fun to drive. There's such a better technology than, than the old cars. And so uh, you will always find people who are keen to talk about EVs and, and cars. And yeah, it opens a lot of doors. So there are certainly products that are harder to sell. <laughs> Well, uh, Carola, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you uh, today on the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jonathan. It was a pleasure.